Well, uh, like uh, I lead listeners, you already know who we have today. He's back for a third time around. Third time is the charm. And uh, because of how he empowers uh, you uh, to lead uh, in any room you find yourself in. For those of you who do not know, Dr. Michael O. Emerson, PhD out of uh, now, uh, your PhD, I always like to say the fact that it's from North Carolina, because you know I am from North Carolina, but that's not where you are professor at right now. Uh, professor at um, U of I and the department head uh, for sociology and 15 books, 15 books. Wow, that's a lot of publishing. That's a lot of writing. Yeah, thanks. I'm, I'm really glad to be here. I, I'm going to declare myself an honorary regular with you. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. Covering all things current, okay? <laughs> but that's not all, uh, I lead listeners, uh, 100 publications. And uh, so it's, he has a lot to bring. And um, we want to talk about a subject today with respect to us leading uh, in our current uh, environment. I wanna talk about uh, replacement theory. We talked about critical race theory before, but I really wanna get into that. It's very, very current. And Dr. Emerson always uh, graces us with his insight and knowledge um, about these uh, issues of leadership that I think um, if we're going to lead, we have to, uh, be current on. We have to know what is going on uh, in the culture, in the community that is around us, and then how to navigate that. So um, we just want to deal with this issue. And I want to do a little bit of a comparison. But before we get into a comparison of critical race theory and replacement theory, I want to just uh, read this particular thing. And then uh, want to ask a question about what is replacement theory. On September the 22nd, the cable television host Tucker Carlson provided his own theory as to what was happening at our borders. In a segment entitled, Nothing About What's Happening is an Accident, Carlson said that current US border policy is designed to change the racial mix of the country. In political terms, this policy is called the great replacement or the replacement of legacy Americans with more obedient people with from far away countries. These are direct quotes. And he goes on to say that um, this is a suicidal path for or path for um, Americans and our country. Dr. Emerson, what is replacement theory? Yeah, it's uh, it sounds like it would be in a sense boring, right? Because it's got the word theory in it, but it's uh, a really basic theory that uh, has unbelievable influence. And we'll get into that. So what is it? It's just like Tucker Carlson described. It's this idea that there is a conspiracy to replace people of European descent with everyone else. And it will be done by shifting immigration patterns, opening up borders, uh, reducing birth rates among white folks, increasing birth rates among everyone else. And the reason that matters and why like someone like Tucker Carlson would care so much is, is thought that everyone who's not of European descent will have very different ideas of what culture should be, how politics should run, and uh, they will replace white folks, not only demographically, but politically and culturally, and whites will be reduced to nothing but a legacy group that used to have a lot of power in the world, but no longer will. The, the, the when I can try to keep the steam from coming out of my ears when I hear that, mm -hmm. because on its face, it's racism. Mm -hmm. On its face, it is a, um, it clearly is saying uh, European white Americans um, have, is the norm and not just the norm, but superior. Yeah. 
Because whenever you think that we will be succumbed or subjugated um, and someone else's thoughts um, is now being the thought life of everything, you then in some way think your thoughts, your politics, your culture is superior. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah. So, Without a doubt, so yeah. then is that rooted in a in a uh, a white supremacist piece or what? What are some of the antecedents and the uh, the origins of this uh, theory? Yeah, it, it definitely comes out of, of, of white supremacy, white nationalism, and um, yeah, the whole idea of uh, this colonial mindset that's existed, because we can talk about where it came from, but it originated actually in France. Mm -hmm. uh, so kind of out of this colonial mindset. And there, the great fear is, it's interesting how religion and, and race get interwoven. The great fear is Muslims. We're allowing Muslims to come into our country and they are taking over, they will displace us in every single way, culturally, but they'll also displace us religiously. So it has to be resisted. In this whole thinking, and you, you raise it, rightly raise it with uh, the person out of, um, out of uh, France who came up with this thought and idea. And then of course, Americans kind of jumped on that uh, with the immigration of Muslims into Europe and, and those pieces. Again, here's this fear that it seems as though we have of people of color. Because a uh, majority uh, Muslims, one could probably argue, people of color, Mediterranean yeah. uh, skins, uh, the melon is deeper and darker yep. than, than whites. And therefore, this attachment to my melon as in a sense of having superiority. Is that making any sense? Yeah, it is always the theme is white Europeans, everybody else in the world, whether you're going to call them Muslims, immigrants, whatever, it's, it's always at the base race rather than humans, even though folks often will argue there is no race. And yet, you can see that this whole theory is based on that. Where do we go as leaders when confronted with this? Well, you know, it's... Uh, the irony is that it's called a theory. So if it's a theory, theories are meant to be tested because theories are just uh, uh, proposed explanations. They aren't truth. They're somebody's explanation for what's going on. So one thing leaders can do is say, if they're encountering people that are supporting this, what is the evidence? Are the facts aligning with this? Or is this simply something you want to agree with and why? So that's one thing, and we'll get more into this, I suppose, later, but we, we have to move away from, from this theory and uh, focus more on what we can learn from the Bible, because this has no place among Christians. When we come into this, we talk about theory. Now let's take critical race theory, another very uh, hotly discussed uh, theory. Yep. Uh, how would you compare the two? Yeah. So For just those a, who don't know critical race theory, can you give them a little snippet of a definition of that? Yeah, sure. So it's is it's an academic theory. In a way, great replacement theory didn't come out of really academia. That we can get into that in a moment. But critical race theory is an academic theory that came out of Harvard and some other places. And it argues that uh, law and legal institutions are designed specifically to be racist. Uh, because they're designed by white folks at the origins of, of this society. So instead of race being biologically grounded, it argues that it's race is socially constructed because it will benefit those who get defined as white and further their economic and political interests. And we'll use things like the law to justify why some people get more than others. Given the division in America, what theory would you develop to traverse the divide? Yeah, so there's no easy answer there, but 
if we just quickly think about both of those theories, right, are focusing on the effect of a category that humans have clearly made important. God may have made us look different and give us uh, a lot of variety, but we've put categories, made those into categories, assigned them meanings, and used them to rank people and to compete against one another. So we need something else. So one thing I always try to say, no matter who we are, life is a struggle. Every single human, every family unit, every group is struggling against all the things that either try to lead us to death or to just misery in this world. So we're all in it together, but we don't act as if we are. We, we get into tribalism. Biblically, I think, you know, the answer is there, right? We all have one father. We all have been labeled by our father as we are members of a same family. So we have to have a complete reorientation, a complete rethinking. Why do I care if I am white? whether I'm whites are replaced or not it has nothing to do with anything. We're humans. What I care about is are people following Christ? Are we supporting each other? Are we trying to fight against injustice? So I just think we need a complete refocus. You know, um, when you talk about um, that, uh, what comes to my mind in terms of um, how we traverse it and we think in terms of biblical uh, prescripts and we think in terms of that. Uh, I remember in my time, uh, as you know, I, I'm a retired Air Force chaplain. And I remember uh, I was trained um, in a, um, what some will say a liberal uh, seminary. Um, I think it was more in terms of uh, liberation theology was my training. And so when I uh, concluded uh, my uh, seminary and um, I was already in the Air Force. So when I concluded it, the Air Force made me a chaplain. Um, it, was, it was the best job in all the world other than this one. And I remember so well being, uh, and, and I don't mean it in a negative way, but indoctrinated. I was, I was trained and developed as a African-American pastor coming out of a uh, African-American seminary, accredited seminary uh, and, um, and um, liberation theology was the core of that training. So I had ideas and thoughts in my head about whites. That's how I was trained. I was, uh, my family and I was then stationed over in Germany on one of my assignments. For the first time ever, I pastored whites. Hmm. I never pastored whites. I, I, I had a, a predisposition, one might even say a prejudice, um, out of my training. Um, and it's not to throw shade on my seminary, which I love and care a great deal about. But I will say then that um, what happened is I realized what you just said. Hmm. It did not matter. The problems that they brought me were the same problems. Hmm they had white faces on them. Yep. Children, their spouses, their marriages, their finances, all of those were issues going on in the lives of the congregants. I had a predisposition that you, how are you having problems? You're white. Yes. Mm -hmm. You can't be dealing with the same issues that I'm dealing with or my tribe is dealing with or my community is dealing with, it changed my whole thinking. It's profound, yeah. It, it, was, it was profound. And the interesting thing is, is that the congregation grew. <laughs> it grew 
And it probably grew as we know leadership because I grew. Mm. Yes. Um, it was the eight o'clock service um, and you couldn't get a seat by the end of it. Which is amazing, right? Who gets up at 8 a.m. on a Sunday for worship? But that's awesome. <laughs> and, who, and who would have thought that, that 90% of the congregants were white, were getting up that early to hear an African-American pastor or chaplain? Now the, now, the context is different. We have to understand that the context is the military context. We're overseas. We're at a, uh, we had Bitburg Air Base, Germany. Uh, the context is totally different. The community is different. All of those things are different. So we have to add in those variables. But nevertheless, I learned a profound lesson uh, that uh, problems um, may be more severe than in other areas and other communities, but problems were had by all humans. And I think that's what you're saying. Yeah, that's right. And I learned how to then respond to that. Um, and interestingly enough, now here's the, here's the racism that came, comes in. When the, when the service grew, when it grew, uh, my white bosses took me out of it. Wow. And why do, you, why do you think they did? Well, why do you think they did? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know the situation much more. I can, give, I can get a guess for sure, but. How did they, you feel at that point? The, the, I, I was uh, really bothered. They took me out of that service and put me in the, uh, the service that had uh, all African-Americans in it um, because they said, all right, um, we have a lay minister there. The command chaplain over all of Europe wants uh, chaplains to serve. All, all chapel services need to be led by chaplains, which was correct. Um, and therefore you need to go over there and we need to pull you out of there. Well, they were at two different times. I could have done both. They were at eight o'clock and at one o'clock. So I could have done both. I did both for a period of time, but at, after my bosses saw the increase in influence, that was too much influence for me to have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is what we keep bumping up against, isn't it? it is. Because here you have this incredible realization you're doing ministry among God's people and then the demon, the endless demon of racism. Boom. Yep. That's what we fight always. It is. And uh, I remember so well my, uh, my boss at the time, um, and I knew it was some racism things that were going on. Um, he came to me. And um, I was there, his family was there. We were all having a standard uh, after service fellowship. And um, I came up to him and his son, little kid, probably uh, in the first or second grade, if that says to me, uh, says, dad, that's the black, there's the black man. <laughs> oh my word. <laughs> so, <laughs> you could have had him for a nickel. Uh, <laughs> he was completely, he, he, he didn't know how to react, but because in the military, he outranked me. So there was nothing I could do or say, mm -hmm. uh, but just stand there. So whatever reaction that he was going to have was going to be the reaction that I had to live with. Mm -hmm. wow. You know, but uh, there you have it. So I understand what you're saying in terms of the human race, yeah. um, but the divided world that we live in is uh, one that should be traversed by biblical principles, if I hear you correctly. Yes. And so that's what I would say, like, and you know, we've talked about this before, why critical race theory is useful, even for Christians, because it points us to that reality of <laughs> we all struggle, we're all trying to, uh, and all should be helping each other as a family, but the system isn't playing, isn't fair. And critical mm. race theory points out where and how and why. And so we need to use that knowledge to together fight against it. Given that, if you were to look at now and the uh, mid to late 1800s, the early 1900s, in a reconstruction or post-reconstruction lens, 
what would you say are the similarities to then to now and the differences? You always ask great questions. <laughs> so after the Civil War, right, we had this, the Reconstruction period it was an amazing period of about only about 12 years, but we saw African Americans elected at all levels of office. We had more uh, senators to the US government than we've had since that were African American, just mind blowing. So um, what's similar is this, and there's some really good books on this actually. Northern, Southern, uh, Northern whites and Southern whites to try to have peace among them. Northern whites appeased Southern whites and unified around whiteness instead of around the nation or region or anything else. So they, they acquiesced to what Southern whites were asking for. No 40 acres and a mule, uh, Jim Crow segregation being instituted and all those things. And Northern whites, including the leaders said they're willing to do that because they too feared we're getting replaced. That's really what they fear. Like that's not the way the world works. White folks make the rules. White folks are in office. White folks get elected. Whatever's happening here, we can't have that. And so a new system was put into place so it wouldn't happen. If you were to look at today, what similarities do you see in that today? Yeah, so, okay, so it's happening. We had a black president. We have a African-American slash Indian vice president right now. These aren't acceptable to lots and lots of white folks. It just doesn't feel right. So we have to accuse them of not being American or they're incompetent or the, we're, they're putting in policies that allow immigrants to come because they know immigrants will vote for them and they're stealing our power. So we've got to push back. So when we're talking about this replacement theory, whether you think it's an insane uh, far right theory or not, it actually has real impacts. People are getting elected by espousing this, right? They're getting lots of lots of white, of white votes. We've had several mass shootings in which the folks that did the mass shootings all in the last just like three, four years, specifically cited this, the great replacement, that they are doing their part to stop the great replacement. So it's impactful, big time. It is extremely impactful and it is really harming our um, country. We then uh, came through um, the reconstruction, uh, the dark period, we came through that, um, we got past that. Um, we then um, got past uh, Plessy versus Ferguson. We went to Topeka Board of Education and we did those things. And uh, 40s and 50s, 60s, we began to address and become a better country. Uh, we even made Martin Luther King uh, have a holiday. How do you see us moving forward now when it seems as though that we're on the cusp of another new post-reconstruction? Mm -hmm. this, so this theory has to be pushed back at, at all levels. And so when, whenever there's a chance, it has to be pushed back. There is a reality, and the reality is a demographic reality. There are changes that are happening, not because of any conspiracy, conspiracy but um, white folks, they don't have very many children anymore for all kinds of reasons. And so uh, they are becoming a smaller and smaller percentage. That will happen. I mean, we've been saying that for decades, and it's happening. Usually we say around 2040, there'll be a change. So... Uh, Hard to answer. I, I would say, I would say this. All the things that you cited were people taking agency and actively resisting falsehood and pushing for truth to better people, uh, uh, whole people. Same here. Push against great replacement. It, it has no empirical finding. Uh, it's 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 white nationalism. It's white supremacy, and call it call it what it is. Jesus called things as it were. He did. 
Yep. And, and when it got him in trouble. It got him in trouble and it got him on the cross. Mm-hmm. Uh, but his resurrection by design is supposed to pull us all together. How do we propagate and proclaim what he did and not who he is mm. to bring us um, beyond the moment that we're in? Again, another un, un, incredible question. What he did as opposed to who he is. What he did was even his own follower, disappointed even his own followers who wanted him, as you know, to overthrow the Romans and seize political power he had. I wasn't interested in that. He's interested in a, a whole new creation, a whole new kingdom, God's kingdom. So what he did was face rejection, speak truth, and even when it led to his death. So he displayed courage. He displayed uh, principled living, commitment to all people. He wasn't going to, that's one thing I, I'm always amazed by Jesus. He would not bow to the tribalism, the tribalism that was in his time. He would not bow to our tribalism now. I just think that's the ultimate demonic method, the devil's way. Just, that's right, you're going to divide. How are you going to divide? You're not all together in this you're with those folks that's your community not those people jesus kept saying no women you're part of this uh every ethnic group you're part of this so i think that's what we have to proclaim i know that's what you proclaim and amen and so then as a leader we have to then uh, not only talk about who jesus was but what jesus did and interestingly enough, and I know, uh, and we're growing to, uh, drawing to the close and the end of our time together. Um, um, but what, interestingly enough, when I was doing this sermon series, and we're talking about salvation and all, and one of the really hot topics now is uh, LGBTQ plus um, that is happening. And so I think if we're, and, and, that, and here's another community, here's another group of people that are saying to the rest of this group of people, uh, you're not treating us right. And, and then the, the group of people, and to include some Christians in these groups are saying, well, you, you, well we, we're not treating you right because you're not normative. Um, and so, as I was studying about this whole evangelism, how, how do you need to be evangelistic? I always try to find scripture to support what I'm thinking. Came to mind the passage of the Ethiopian unit. The Ethiopian unit is one example in which we have where a person was physically altered, mm-hmm. but yet still worthy of the gospel. Because the eunuch, of course, is a male that has had his uh, genitals altered to keep him from um, taking advantage of the concubine of the king. Mm-hmm. And so that when that came to me, uh, uh, and I'm, I don't want to eisegete at all, uh, but I thought, well, is, is this one example in which we have where Christ is saying, back to Christ, um, in the wake of his resurrection, in the, in the wake of the power of the Holy Spirit, moving throughout um, um, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world, is the text telling us everybody should have and receive the gospel irrespective of what tribe they find themselves. Without, without doubt. The t- right, we're all sinners, so none of us is better than another, so it's for everyone. We hope that when we come to Christ, then whatever transformative work needs to be done, Christ will do it. But it, the, the word is for everyone, absolutely. And therefore, as a leader, if you, if you were speaking to a leader right now, um, a leader in politics, a leader in the church, uh, a leader in the community, 
those three leaders, if you were to say something to them now um, where they can have handles to lead others, um, with these two pieces beside us, um, critical race theory, replacement theory, post reconstruction or new reconstruction, what would you say to those three individuals as handles as to how to better lead? Mm. We hear this a lot, but it's true. So the arc of justice is long, but it's going in a direction. There'll be steps back, but there are more steps forward. So your role as a leader is to get us to move more forward than backward. And it is not to divide, but to unite. So any way in which you can find ways to bring us together across the things that divide us and move us forward to justice for all, that to me is what leadership is. And it's gonna be very dependent and contextual given where you are, what you're leading, the time you're in, the people groups you're working with. So I can't give the specifics, but right down the forest, you work out the trees. What is the goal? The goal is to bring us to unity that Christ promises us and justice. So how do we get there? And having said that, uh, Dr. Emerson, you already know the last question I always ask everybody. So you still got to answer, even if you give me the the last answer that you gave me. <laughs> that is, how do you lead in any room that you find yourself in? How do you lead in any room that you find yourself in? So I lead in a collaborative style where I want the group to discover where we're going. Or rather, so I don't lead from, here's what we're going to do. And I know there are a lot of leaders like that. That's definitely oh. mine. I may have an opinion of where we want to go, but I we need to work together. So I lead collaboratively. And I find that when you do, we, we walk together. Well, let's walk together. Let's move forward. And uh, Dr. Emerson, again, thank you. Uh, three times is a charm and uh, the quadrennial will be even better. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you for joining us. Thank you for sharing your knowledge with um, uh, our iLead listeners. I think it's very important that we take current issues and give them handles that they will be able to lead well um, and to lead ultimately us uh, to uh, the foot of cross, the foot of the cross, I should say, to Christ. Thank you so much. Thank you, such a privilege, really appreciate it. I don't know, I think Dagny was trying to do more than one thing at a time. Does she usually end it? Yes. Okay. So I'm waiting for her. She's doing her life group. Let me <laughs> text her. So what is the latest, uh, Dr. Emerson? Well, um, I'm what are you trying, working on now? Yeah, I'm trying to finalize. I got about a chapter, chapter and a half to go on this book about the religion of whiteness. So gonna get that done this summer. And yeah, how about you? Are you getting any time to do any of your writing or has it been pretty tough? I am and I'm going to um I'm going to do something I shouldn't do. I'm gonna take my vacation time and write. Okay. I promise you, uh, <laughs> I promise you to have those two chapters by the end of July. So I'm going to uh, really work hard at getting them. Great, that's exciting. Uh, 